Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Yesterday I told you that to add John 6 to yesterday's lesson would have taken way too much time, so we've given it its own day. And it is picking up with the same story we saw yesterday, but focusing a lot more on the feeding of the 5,000. It gives us a lot more details of that day. And there's a couple of things that I want to point out to you here that are slightly different than what we saw yesterday in Matthew that give us just a little bit more insight into this particular two days is actually what this chapter covers, two days of history. So the feeding of the multitudes, take two, uh, John chapter six, verse one. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd followed him because of the sign, they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. So hold that in your head. They're following him because they see him doing miracles. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming towards him. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? I want to point out something really quickly here. So this is the second Passover mentioned in the book of John. The first one being in John 2, 13 and the third one being in John eleven fifty five. So here's why I think that this is significant. So the other gospel writers don't mention three Passovers. They usually will mention two, and in some cases only mention one. But um, John here mentions three Passovers. So the John 2.13 Passover is right prior to the wedding at Cana, prior to his first ministry, prior to his public appearance. And so it's saying that they were getting ready for the Passover. And I guess the Passover technically came after the wedding of Cana, but he was getting ready for that. And so that was the first mention at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. In John 11, this is at the end of Jesus's ministry. This is the last week of the life of Christ. And then we have this Passover here in John 6. So it's three Passovers. And you have one that's kind of at the beginning of his ministry, right before he, or right after he starts public ministry. You have one that's at the conclusion of his public ministry, right before he's going to die. And so you have these two years in between with a third Passover in between. And people will often say, uh, you know, Jesus did his public ministry for three years. There's nowhere in the text that it says that. Nowhere. I think what people do is they base it off of three Passovers in John. Well, there are three Passovers, uh, a Passover per year. So that's three years. And and maybe that's the case. I, I think the math is a little bit off because the first Passover occurs shortly after his 40 days in the wilderness with the Holy Spirit. And then he does the wedding at Cana, does his miracle there, and his public ministry begins. And then there's the Passover. And then there's the Passover the week that he's going to die. And, and so if you look at it that way, then you have two full years because the ministry of Jesus is bookended by these two Passovers with a third Passover in the middle. So maybe his ministry is about two years. If you back up to his baptism, maybe two, two and a half years. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I like the details that John provides for us here about the Passovers. So verse four again. The Passover of the Feast of the Jews was at hand and lifting up his eyes and seeing the large crowd was coming toward him. Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test Philip, for he knew himself what he was going to do. Philip answered and said, 200 denarii would not be enough bread for each of them to get a little. A denarius was a day's wage. It was a silver coin that was worth one day's wages. So he says 200 days wages of, of money would not be enough to buy everybody a little bit of bread. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? So kind of picture something more akin to a tortilla or a pita roll or something like that. There's five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And, and Andrew is like, this isn't enough for everybody. And Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down about 5,000 in number again, not counting women and children. And he took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing would be lost. And they gathered up and filled 12 baskets with fragments. A couple of things here. One, there will be, there are some people who reduce this uh, there, are, there are some so-called Christian people who say, we don't believe in miracles. We don't believe uh, that any of the 10 plagues were anything more than natural. Uh, sorry, the 10 plagues in Egypt were anything more than natural phenomena. And they say, we just don't believe in miracles. We don't believe that those things happen, which is such a weird position for a so-called Christian to take because the pinnacle of our faith, the, the height of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus. And if you don't believe in any miracles, then you can't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And if you can't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, then you're not a Christian. And, and it's interesting to me that there are some people who will teach that 
that Jesus didn't actually multiply the fish and the bread. What they say happened is they're looking over the crowds, at least 5,000 people here, not counting the women and children, and there's not enough food for them. And that the little boy came forward humbly and gave his lunch and that the rest of the crowd, so moved by his generosity, began to open up their coats and pull out their secret lunch that they had packed that they were hiding from everybody else so they wouldn't have to share because they were so moved by the generosity of this little boy, they decided to to share as well. And it's just not at all what the text is saying. It's not at all about the miraculous power of Jesus. Jesus multiplied these fish and these bread, which is why he can say to his disciples, why are you worried that we have no fish fish or bread? Did you not see what I did? With the, with the bread for the 5,000 or the bread for the 4,000. It's what Christ has done. So anyway, when, when you bump into people who want to reduce this and make this not a miracle of Jesus, go the other way, especially if they're a preacher or a teacher. The other thing is they, they don't feel like there's going to be enough for so many people. And back in 2 Kings chapter 4, we, we bump into one of our favorite guys, Elisha. And Elisha is gathering with the prophets and somebody brings 20 loaves of bread. And Elisha says to one of the prophets, put this before the hundred prophets. There were 100 prophets. He goes, put this before the prophets to eat. And the guy's kind of incredulous. And he goes, what is 20 loaves for a hundred men? That's not enough to feed a hundred men. But Elisha says, do it. And they did it. And everybody was filled and they had leftovers. So 20 loaves of bread split between a hundred people and there were leftovers. And that was amazing and miraculous. And here Jesus takes five loaves and two fish and multiplies it for more than 5,000 people. When the people saw the sign that he had done, remember they're following him according to verse 2 because of the miracles he was doing. When the people saw the sign that they had done, they said, indeed, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, they're referencing one of two things. They're referencing either Malachi, the very last two verses of the Old Testament that says the prophet was going to come as a forerunner to the Messiah, or they're referencing Deuteronomy 18, where Moses says, God is going to raise up another prophet for you like me who will lead you. So that's one of the two things that they're referencing, either Elijah as the predecessor to the Messiah or a prophet like Moses who would lead the people. And and so that's kind of where their, their idea of who Jesus is ends. And it says, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So the, these Jews are so enamored with Christ and his miracles that they're ready to make him the king of Israel, the king of the Jews. And so he withdraws from himself to a quiet place to pray. Now, we saw this yesterday already. When evening had come, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into the boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was dark and Jesus had not yet come to them, but the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea coming near the boat and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were headed. On the next day, The crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not gotten into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had left alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was no longer there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? Teacher, when did you come here? Because they're doing the math. There was only one boat on the other side. The disciples left without him. How did he get here? How is he on the other side of the sea? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So yesterday they were seeking him, according to verse 2, because of the miracles that he did. Today they're seeking him because he fed them and he supplied food for them. So free meal, that's that's why they're chasing him today. And he says to them, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For uh, For on him God the Father has set his seal. And this is a little bit like in John chapter four, the woman at the well who comes to get some water. And Jesus says, if you knew who I was and who was asking you for a drink, you would ask me for water. I'd give you the living water of which if someone drinks, they'll never thirst again. They said to him, this is such a key text. Please, please try to commit John six twenty nine to memory. So look at verse 28 and 29. So when they said, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in the one whom he has sent. If anyone ever comes to you and says, what work do I need to do to be saved? What work do I need to do to be obeying God? The answer Jesus gives in John six twenty nine is this is the work you must do. Believe in the one that God sent. 
So they said to him, uh, listen to this hypocrisy, listen to this cynicism. They said to him, what sign will you do that we may believe? What work will you perform? Why is this hypocrisy? Why is this cynicism? Well, because they're following him the next day because, sorry, the previous day because he's doing miracles. After he multiplies the bread, they're so in love with him, they want to make him a king. And now he says, no, you need to believe in the one that God sent. You need to believe in me. And now they're pulling back a little bit and they're like, do a sign, do something to prove that you're him. And it's so stupid because they're already they're already following him because of the signs that he's doing. They're already impressed by the things that he's done, but now they're backing up because they just wanted him to be a king. They're not looking for him to be the Messiah, the Savior. Verse 31, they said, Even our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So he's referring to himself saying, I am the true bread of life that comes down out of heaven. You remember manna back from Exodus 16. It was what fed the people and nourished the people for the 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. It would appear miraculously on the ground in the morning. It would melt away in the heat of the day. If they kept it overnight, it stunk and bred maggots in a foul odor. And so they're like, do a sign so that we can know you're the savior. Like, hey, here's a good idea. What if you gave us manna? So Jesus says, I am the true man. I am the true bread that comes down out of heaven. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Give us the bread of which we'll never, if we eat, we'll never hunger again. Jesus goes on to say, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. And there's several verses that makes us think of, like I said already, John 4, John 7, uh, Isaiah 55, Revelation 22. And he says, but I have said that you have seen me and you do not yet believe in me. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, he's indicating who he is, where he's come from, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but that I will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. The Jews grumbled about him and said, because he said, I am the bread of life that come, come down out of heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? What does he, what does he mean now I've come down out of heaven? That reminds us of what we saw a few days ago, right? Where the people say, isn't this Jesus? Isn't, isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't he the, the son of, of Mary? Don't we know his brothers? And they were offended because of the signs that he was doing. Jesus said to them, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. So this is a really interesting thing. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. But the Bible's already told us in Matthew that no one can know the father unless the, uh, unless the son reveals the father to him. And so there's a, uh, a symbiotic relationship between the father and the son where each is revealing the other. And he goes on to say, so no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father will come to me. That's Isaiah 53. And also um, kind of a reference to Jeremiah 31. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. He says, your fathers did indeed eat manna in the wilderness, but they all died. This is the bread that comes down from out of heaven so that if you eat of it, you will not die. So they're wanting miraculous manna from heaven. And Jesus goes, yeah, I could give you miraculous manna from heaven, but if you eat it, you'll still die. Believe in me and you won't die. Believe in me and you'll have life. I am the living bread, he says, that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is his body being given as a sacrifice for mankind for sin. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down out of heaven. Not like the bread, not like the manna that the fathers ate in the wilderness and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. This is about the fourth time that he said, if you partake of me, you have everlasting life. 
Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So get this picture in your head. He's been on this side of the sea. Uh, he fed the multitudes. They're following him because of the miracles. He sells back to the other side of the sea. And everything from the time they found him the next day forward, the rest of the story is him teaching in the synagogue. This is where the people were coming to learn and to study. And he's teaching these hard things in the synagogue. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said, do you take offense at this? Then he said, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted by the Father. And after that, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Now, be really careful. We've talked about this very briefly before. It's worth repeating. The word disciple does not mean Christian. It doesn't. It means student. It means learner. There were people who were disciples of John the Baptist. There were people who were disciples of this Pharisee or that Pharisee or this religious organization or that one. And there there were students and learners of Jesus as well. But when it came down to it where he said, it's not enough that you want you believe in my signs. It's not enough that you want to make me king. Unless you believe that I am who I say I am, you have no part with me. And at that teaching, they quit being his disciples. It doesn't mean they quit being Christians. They weren't Christians. We, we can't read the word disciple as Christian. It means they were sitting under his teaching and then they decided not to sit under his teaching anymore. They were his students and then they weren't his students. In the 21st century, in most church settings, when we talk about being a disciple of Jesus, We mean that as a follower of Christ, a Christian. That is not the first century meaning of the word. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to leave me as well? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus said, did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke this about Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he was one of the twelve, and he was going to betray him. We will talk more about Judas being one. Uh, we've already looked at this when we were in the Psalms, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109, but we'll, I'll remind you of that a little bit later in Matthew. And so Jesus says, did I not choose all of you? And yet one of you is a devil. One of you is an enemy and adversary. And he spoke this about Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot for one of the 12, he was going to betray him. And so there's a little bit more details about the feeding of the 5,000, a little bit more of what's going on in terms of what the people believed about Jesus and what they would refuse to believe about Jesus and why they were following him and why they would cease to follow him. And so uh, just a little bit more information. I love it. I think it's an incredible story and it's worth us knowing. Tomorrow we will be in Matthew 16 and 17. So please join us then and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.